happy Mother's Day to all our mothers in the house. Uh, it's lovely to see all of you and uh, wish you on this day. Uh, we will launch into our um, sermon today, which is just a continuation of our Sermon on the Mount series, um, but it's aptly uh, going to be titled, Do Not Worry. Now, mothers don't have an edge on worrying. Um, my mother does, but <laughs> mothers typically don't have an edge on worrying. Dads can uh, worry uh, sufficiently. Um, but Hope did such a good job of reading for us, didn't she? Uh, in chapter 6, verse 25 to 34. So 25 uh, begins with the phrase, therefore. So verse, um, uh, verse 25 says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. So anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, we have to ask ourselves, what is it therefore? And you know what it is there for by just looking at the previous verses, right? So we ended our sermon last, uh, last week by looking at, of course, giving, prayer, and fasting. And that ended in verse 18. And then we jumped to verse 25. So there's about verse 19 all the way to 24 that I skipped, at least in the reading. And that is the context that Jesus is referring to when he says, therefore. So these verses are talking about wealth and our attitude to money and so verse 19 says do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth again this idea of storing up again this is an agrarian society right these are not the financial markets of, of our day right so these are agrarian societies so the idea of storing up is immediately bringing to our mind ideas of the barn and harvesting and keeping the harvest, right? So that's the idea. So do not store up, pile up tr for yourselves treasures on earth is what Jesus is saying. Instead, store up, pile up treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, so is your heart. Where your treasure is, so is your heart. Again, this idea of storing up is really important. And again, throughout the Gospels, there are many other places where Jesus talks about the futility of that effort of trying to pile up wealth and keep it somewhere, right? And in this particular case, Jesus talks about how stuff eats it up, right? Or another place, Jesus says, well, you know, you will tell yourself, ye drink and be merry, but the Lord says, today your life will be required of you, then who will inherit everything that you have saved up, right? So there's another place where Jesus does that too. But here, the point is, moths and termites will eat up all of the stuff that you have piled up. Instead, store up treasures in heaven. Jesus is talking about this heavenly point of view on money, on, on storing up, on saving, and so on and so forth, right? And right after he talks about those few verses, he jumps into the passage on the eye. He says, the eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, it all, your whole body is healthy. If your eye is corrupted, then how great the darkness within. I mean, again, eyes are, of course, the sensory organs that are inputting information. So if the inputting information is corrupted, in other words, your shades are corrupted, then everything that you are, you could see a wonderful, uh, doesn't matter what you're seeing, it is the inputting organ that is corrupted. Therefore, whatever goes in is just creating great darkness, right? So he says, go, and again, Proverbs says, guard your heart for from it is the wellspring of life, right? This source guarded, this place of inputting of data into your soul, guard that well, because if that becomes corrupted, it's just an entry into darkness inside, right? And so then Jesus goes on to say, your eye is the lamp of your body, and that section concludes by saying, you can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one or you know, lo and love the uh, you know, uh, and love the other. He says, "The God of wealth and your heavenly Father, you can serve both of them. You need to choose one." So what Jesus is doing now, when he says, "Therefore, do not worry about your life," he's really connecting these thoughts together. First, he says, "Since you've stored up your treasures in heaven, where nothing can eat away." 
and destroy. And then secondly, since the core of your heart and your motivations, which is your eyes, are sanctified. And then third, since you've given up serving the God of money, which is mammon, you're not going to serve the God of money, but you've committed your lives to serving our Heavenly Father. He says, then do not worry. Don't worry. How many of you have heard of the name Robert Keith McFerrin Jr.? Anyone? How many of you heard of Bob Marley? Right? Everyone's heard of Bob Marley. No one's heard of Robert Keith McFerrin Jr.? How about Bobby Keith McFerrin Jr.? So Bobby McFerrin is the famous jazz artist who wrote the number one U.S. pop song hit in 1988, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Have you listened to the lyrics? If you know it, just go ahead, say it with me, all right? Here's, I'm just gonna read you some of, his, some of the lyrics of the song. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry. Be happy. In every life, we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy now. Ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry, be happy. The landlords say your rent is late. He may have to litigate. Don't worry, be happy. Ain't got no cash, ain't got no style, ain't got no gal to make you smile, don't be happy. Because when you worry, your face will frown, and that will bring everybody down. So don't worry, be happy. So of course, we love this song. But did you notice, and of course, it took off, because everyone worries, and the advisors, come on, man, don't worry, you're going to bring everybody else down. So come on, cheer up a little. I mean, and easily, number one hit, right? I mean, we all get that. But have you noticed that the song doesn't really tell you why you should not worry, right? It tells you, others are going to get sad, so please don't worry, but it doesn't really tell you why are you worried and what is it that you can do to get rid of this worry, right? So in this passage that Hope read for us, Jesus begins by saying, do not worry about your life. So he begins with the general, he begins with the broad, your entire life, then he specifies what you will eat and what you will drink and what you will wear. What you will drink, what, what you will eat, what you'll drink, what you'll wear. Why? And then the rationale is, you know, I have to admit, right? Some of us are a little far removed from this, from, from an era of being worried about food. Some of us may not be, right? But of all the, you know, we didn't have a lot growing up, but my dad's core value in life was you can have no money, but you've got to eat well. <laughs> so my dad made sure, I mean, eating well in Indian homes meant having really good fish and really good lamb. And we always had plenty of really good food, right? But so I'm, I can't say I've ever gone a day hungry, well, maybe in, maybe when I was in school. But yeah, but I had a meal, you know, but it, I can't say that I've gone hungry per se. But there are plenty of people throughout our world and maybe even in our church that have had that experience of praying for food, right? Not when food is there, but praying for food to get there, right? And Jesus is saying, don't worry about food to a group of people that are subsistence, subsist, subsistence people, right? They are going day by day and, and depending on God for the rain and for the harvest and so on and so forth. So, it's, but at the same time, it's not just that specific food that you need for that day, but it's also metaphoric, right? It's, it, is, it is talking about our basic needs, right? Don't worry about your basic needs, food, and then it goes and say body, right? And the logic is, is not life more than food and is not body more than clothing, right? Jesus' analogy is from the least to the greatest, right? That's the, he's gonna follow this logic throughout in, in various, uh, in, in the following scripture. So the point Jesus is telling us in this passage is you must have a God perspective. You must have a God perspective, that is, you have life. 
life is bigger than eating, drinking, and wearing, right? In other words, your life is bigger than the enjoyment and the pleasures and materialism. How do I explain this? It's like, you know, it's like having a pimple on your nose. Anyone can relate to that? You know, and it's not just a gendered thing, okay? I'm sure you guys look, look at yourself in the mirror sufficiently too, right? But think about it. It's like having a pimple on your nose and the whole world is collapsing in your mind. Like, I can't go outside. I got this, you know, zit on my nose. And, you, you know, you, you look at the mirror and, and in your mind that zit is like bigger than like, um, I don't know, bigger than your face, right? But at the same time, the point is, it's like Jesus saying, hey, you have a face, you see? And we've made it so much about a little zit. And that's kind of the argument here. Like, you're focusing so much on this thing, but you have life, right? There's breath in your lungs. And then Jesus goes on in verse 25 to paint for us two scenarios. First is the lesson from the birds. In verse 25, Jesus says, look at the birds. They do not sow or reap. In other words, he, Jesus is using agrarian language, right? He, Jesus is saying, they do not sow or reap, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. So Jesus is talking about who is the bird's provider. Yes, you're so worried about your family, about your children, about their school, what, whatever it is, but Jesus is saying, think about the birds. Who feeds them? And Jesus is saying, your heavenly Father feeds them. And then Jesus asks two questions. First question is, are you not much more valuable than they? And then Jesus asks the second question, right? So again, are you not much more from the least to the greatest? If this is how the heavenly Father takes care of the bird, then how much more will he take care of you? You who is his children, you are precious to God, far more precious than birds, right? That's the argument. And then the second question is, can you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? You can lengthen your life by worrying, can you? And what Jesus is doing is he's highlighting the futility of worrying and trying to sort it all out in your head. Here's lesson one. I'll call this lesson from the birds. The God who takes care of the birds will also take care of you. The, uh, the point is, your heavenly Father knows, and if he knows, he will provide for you. Now, this word provide is such an interesting word, right? Because provide, we think you have a need, and, you, and when that need is met, we have provision. But it fails to account for a depth of thought and thoughtfulness that goes into preparation and advance uh, awareness and, and uh, um, you know, I, I remember as a child, I might have shared this story. I was in boarding school during the Gulf uh, War eras in Kuwait in the, mid, uh, in the early 1990s. And so uh, in boarding school, we would be able to come home every second Saturday. You know, so every second Saturday, and we would get to see our grandma maybe, you know, once a month or so. So every time we would come home, every second Saturday, and we get to visit our grandma, my grandma would, again, you know, they didn't have a lot of money or anything. So whatever, and they lived in the village. So well, anytime they got anything, um, any sweets like chocolates or little Indian sweets like laddu or whatnot, she would keep it safe and keep it in her little cupboard with her little key. Again, in, in, you know, in traditional Indian clothing, it's basically one long white uh, sheet. Don't say sheet. It's actually a white long, uh, you know, we call it munda, that she would drape around herself. So there's no natural, uh, but there's no sewn pockets. So they have to create a pocket with a little edge of it that falls off on, this, on the waist and they tuck it back in. So she would hide the key in there so that nobody could get access to the little cupboard that she had. And so she would take the key when I would get home. She's like, come here, come here. And she'll take the key, go to the little cupboard, open it, and open her little, you know, recycled uh, plastic jar from like 15 years ago, open it, and pull out the little chocolate and say, here you go, my son, I've been saving it for you. 
right? Of course, is that provision? It certainly is, but it's so much more. It is a grandmother thinking ahead, oh, my grandson is going to come home. I have got to save this, I've got to procure it. Uh, thinking about your need in advance, and the word that is in my language is called kardunu. It's not just providing, it is, um, it is far greater. Our English fails to capture it. The word is preparing. Right? It's, it's a combination of preparing and providing. And that's what God is saying here. If this is how the heavenly father takes care of the birds, how much more will he clothe you? Right? So if the father knows your needs, he will provide for you. And then he switches analogies and Jesus talks about clothes. I remember stumbling on this verse in my high school prom, and I, I was like, I wanted to like, you know, get 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 clothes, and um, I don't think we had a lot of money those days. So I remember stumbling upon this verse and saying, "Oh, I'm worried about clothes." So every time I read this verse, I go back to high school, you know. Then Jesus talks about clothes, and he, now it's not just talking about basic needs; he's talking about secondary needs, right? Clothing could be included in basic needs, but once food and, and, and shelter is met, you know, we can talk about clothes. And Jesus says, look at the flowers. They do not work to be beautiful, is Jesus' point. They do not labor, yet not even the best of human endeavors, which is Solomon, the King Solomon, he says, he is not as beautiful as these tulips and daffodils and carnations, right? He says, and Jesus says, God makes the flowers this way. Flowers are a very interesting analogy in, you know, that Jesus could have used. You know, if Jesus was thinking about just efficiency or utilitarianism, you don't have to make things beautiful. If Jesus is, if God's purpose for plants and you know uh, and trees are just to you know pr uh, take care of the carbon dioxide and produce oxygen, like that is the purpose for these trees, right? And if the purpose for the flowers is pollination, right, and and a place for b to you know for bees to collect you know honey and whatnot, I mean, then there is no need for it to be presented to us in a million different colors. Right? The point that Jesus is making is, in using flower as an analogy, God is not interested in simply efficiency, but God is interested in aesthetics. God values beauty, even in seemingly things with such brevity of life. God values beauty in things, seemingly things with such brevity of life. The point here is, here's the lesson from the flowers. The lesson from the birds is your heavenly father knows and he will take care of you. Here's the lesson from the birds. God is interested in not only providing for your needs, but God is interested in making your life beautiful. God is interested in making your life beautiful. The point is, if that is how God clothes them, that is here today and then tomorrow thrown into the fire, cuanto mas, right, Spanish? How much more will he not clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Ah, oh, that little phrase. It's talking to us, O oh, you of little faith. How much more will he not clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Right? If this is how God provides for the birds, if this is how God takes care of the flowers, won't he do it for you? Won't he do it for you, right? And then you have this summary paragraph right after that. So do not worry about what you eat, what you drink, for pagans run after these things. And there you go again. Your heavenly father knows that you need them, but what should you do? Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Your basic needs, your secondary needs, your need for beauty in your life, your need for your basic things in your life, the things that weigh heavy on you, all of these things will be addressed, but you seek God's kingdom first. And then Jesus concludes this section by saying, therefore, 
Again, you have to ask, why is it therefore, like the birds, like the flowers, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Let me give you three things. Jesus is outlining three reasons for our worry. Three reasons for our worry. Here's the first one. Our worries stem from our lack of trust in our Heavenly Father to take care of us. Our worries stem from our lack of trust in our Heavenly Father to take care of us. And unfortunately, my friends, that hinders our gratitude for God's providence. Our worries stem from our lack of trust in our Heavenly Father to take care of us. You know what we do? You know what we're really good at? We think we are in charge. And we think we are the providers. We have to work hard. We have to bring the bacon home. We have to, take, we have to do this so that our families are provided for. My friends, it is such a me-centered world and we trust in our abilities far more and my friends, that hinders us from really relying on God's providence. The entire insurance industry is built on that premise, right? I am my soul, I listen, I, I've never had insurance in my life. I was a Bible school student, seminary student. Who cares for insurance, right? And then Philip was born. <laughs> you know, before, before that, I was like, yeah, Eunice is fine. You know, sh she'll be fine. There'll be a line of people. She's gonna be, she's gonna be all right. You know, but then I was like, okay, but Philip was born. I was like, okay, and we have a house. I, got, I gotta go get insurance. If anything happens to me, you know what I mean? The whole insurance industry is built on what? We have to help you replace your income, right? And so much of the way that we as Americans think revolves around this. I remember being like blown away by this concept of insurance when I first came to the US. And again, now this is such an important part of our lives, right? Most people in the world don't have health insurance. Don't, most people in the world don't have life insurance. So this concept of has, has got into us, listen, I, I'm an immigrant, but I, it's gotten into me too. I've become American in that way too. But it's gotten to me in such a way that I also have succumbed many times to thinking it is my hard work that puts food on the table. And, and, and the way that our lives are structured hinders us from really saying, God, I trust you. You are my heavenly father. You are my provider. Our worries stem from our lack of trust. And that's what Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. Secondly, our worries stem from our desire for the perpetual more. Our worries stem from, our, from the desire for the perpetual more. And Jesus says this as pagans run after these things. People who don't know God run after accumulating stuff to meet and satiate their wants and their needs and their securities. And he's saying these are pagans. This is what pagans do. But you, you ought not to live like this. Our worries stem from the desire for the perpetual more. More than basic needs, more than secondary needs. We just want more and more and more. And, and the point, problem is that that hinders our gratitude for God's provision, right? It hinders our gratitude for God's provision. And lastly, third point, our worries stem from our focus on tomorrow. And that hinders our gratitude for today. Our worry stem from our lack of trust in our Heavenly Father and therefore we can't think about being grateful for His providence. We're not grateful for God's provision and now we're not grateful for what God has given us today. My friends, gratitude is the antidote to worry. Gratitude is the antidote to worry. And God's answer, Jesus' answer to all of the worries that we face in life is very simple. Two words ordered priorities ordered priorities what does jesus say this is the solution to all of your worries and all of your stresses that you carry ordered priorities what is it seek first god's kingdom and his righteousness all these things will come chasing after you 
right? Using Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And we end up, what, what do we do? Surely goodness and mercy, I will be chasing after you all my life, is what we do. And Jesus' framing is, David's framing at least in the psalm is, they will come chasing after you. You gotta have ordered priorities. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all that you need for your life. Like the wonderful hymn says, all that I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. So you seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, all that you need and all the beauty that you need is added to you. Now, beauty is something that you may say is not a need, but this is the gracious hand of a generous God. So don't worry, be happy. Why? If he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor, how much more will he clothe you? If he watches over every sparrow, how much more does he love you? More than you ask or think or imagine. Worship team, would you come up? According to his power working in us, he's more than enough. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So in summary, if I can put it this way, it's this. Put God first in your life. He will take care of your needs and he will make your life beautiful. But you gotta put God first. Will you pray with me? Lord, we confess, Lord, that we are people that are prone to worry, prone to stress, prone to think about tomorrow, prone to forget the birds and we forget the flowers. So, Lord, today remind us of the birds, remind us of the flowers. If this is how detailed you are in your providence, why do we keep doubting? You're so good, Lord. You're so detailed in your care for even the birds. You've proven to us over and over again how detailed you are in your provision for us. And yet, Lord, we worry. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to be people of gratitude. And Lord, we do pray that you make our lives beautiful and that you help us to see the beauty of all the things that you're doing in our lives. Help us, Lord, to put you first. You are first above everything else, above every little thing you are first and give us trust and faith we pray in jesus name